she went away the days grow long and soon i'll hear old winter song but i miss you most of all my darling when autumn leaves start to fall Today I'm going to start working on a little series here, and I got this from a, I'm, I'm going to plug a few other channels out here today. Amy Nolte Music, very good channel. Um, go check her out. It's a N-O-L-T-E, Amy Nolte. A Amy is A-I-M-E-E. -E. Um, and she does a lot of really good kind of tutorial videos, and, um, and uh, she has a nice personality too, so if you're tired of my cynicism and negativity, you can go check her out and get a whole new, fresh take on these songs. But anyway, I've copied down her tw top 25 songs that you need to know to be, you know, a beginning jazz pianist. These are 25 tunes everybody should know. And I was looking down the list, and I know about 20 of them, I guess. And But, you know, you could... The thing is with, with tunes is, is a as you're learning... You know, you learn open voicings, and you learn rootless voicings, and you learn scales and modes, and you learn some licks and riffs and little devices and things. What you do is you go back and apply them to these, these songs. So, you know, it's not like these songs should get really stale. It's that you should always be, you know, applying new uh, musical technology to, and by technology I mean, you know, intellectual knowledge, things like chords, scales, um, harmony, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, reharmonization, things like that. So, uh, you know, I'll just throw out a few little things. I'll, I'll take the first five of these tunes today and see what we can do with them. So take the A Train. Okay, a song I've never been all that crazy about, but it's got a really good riff in it that goes. Okay, now a lot of books have it as this. With the D flat in there, but most of the people I've heard play it, uh, including Oscar Peterson, do not use that flat. So we're going to do it this way. But you know, if you like it the other way, do it that way. Uh, th I think that happens a lot uh, at jam sessions. Is that the the piano player is not called upon to play the melodies of these songs, and that's you know something you want to make sure you know the melody. So that's something that I'm kind of bad about too, because I'm a singer, or kind of was a singer. I got around to actually playing the melodies. I realized half the time I, <laughs> I really didn't know what the melody very well on the keyboard. So uh, for a multitude of reasons, it's a good idea to know the melodies of these songs. So let's take, uh, take the A train. Let's take, take the A train, and we'll start off with the classic intro. So we got like a C chord and then the D, the D9 chord there and the uh, whole tone scale. Right, and you've got to use that a lot in your improv too. That's a classic, uh, you know, hallmark of the song is that whole tone scale. Not that you have to use it there, but it's, um, it, you know, when the melody hits that flat five, that really suggests the whole tone scale. So anyway, we start with the uh, uh, intro. So, you know, the song's called Take the A Train. You could do something that's kind of reminiscent of a train, and a good video to check out would be m uh, uh, Michael Petrucciani, or maybe it's Michelle, but it's Michael. Michael Petrucciani, a really great pianist, who plays like, does some crazy thing in his left hand.
And you know, you could do the Mr. Rogers thing. Come on, Charlie. go off to the land of make-believe. And, uh, you know, most jazz players live in the land of make-believe anyway. They think they're going to make a living at it. So, uh, you know, it's a good little device to use. Starting off in uh, the key of C, you can learn a classic jazz riff and sound just like everybody else. All right, that's the, uh, using enclosures. So you're enclosing the, the notes of the C major chord like this. And you could do it chromatically if you wanted to. Uh, I don't want to. Maybe I do want to. And then when you get to the D chord, you know, use that whole tone scale if you like. Or you can use like Lydian dominant. That's Lydian dominant. Here's the whole tone. And you can do some chords. Oh, sorry. Something like that maybe. You know, if you have if you have technique, which I obviously don't, you could do something like that. So Of course, that's just a two, five, one there in uh, the key of C. Uh, and then you do it again. Now, here's a good riff you could throw in there on D9. This is the Art Tatum riff here. I think it's it. I, I might have altered it a little bit. But you come up here, you do this, and then this, and then this. Do the same thing. Those three. Same fingers. Maybe you could use four, uh, you know, four there and five up here. Uh, maybe just five the whole time. And go faster that way. Uh, okay, so there, you know, I made my line live, uh, lead into this next two five one, G minor, C seventh, and here's the uh, here's the bridge of the B section. that stupid riff again there. Here's another favorite one. I got this one from Chopin. There you go. It's a, I, I think of it as these little, three little triplets. This one, this one, this one. But you see they're, they're enclosures. So you enclose that F there, I mean the A. And then you enclose the C and you enclose the F. And actually, here's another uh, riff I'll give you that I, I, I kind of made up. I can do that in a few keys pretty well. You know, I play riffs like that whenever I see there's like some uh, other jazz players out there in the audience, you know, and I, I need to impress them with my speed and dexterity. This is a classic. Anytime, anytime you have a two-five-one, you know, going back to the home key, you can always go up a half step, do a two-five there, and then, the, you know, then do the right one. So you know you're coming along. Uh, morning, aren't I? There's th a thing called a shout chorus at the end, and it goes like that. So uh, we talk about um, closed voicings and drop two recently, and so if you start here with C6, then do the diminished as you go up, but I'm going to turn that one into drop two, so the, this part will actually go down and then come up. Run into trouble, so I use two diminished chords. All right, and then <laughs> I, I just 
just thought of that. I thought maybe that might be a cool thing to do. my years of playing, I never bothered to work this shit out, but it's too late now. <laughs> okay, uh, Autumn Leaves. You ought to know this song in several keys. I teach it in this key first because, you know, so there's only one sharp and it's all scale tone seventh chords at first. The two chord, and then it goes to the five chord, and the one chord, and the four chord, and the seven chord, and then the, uh, I guess that's the three, but it's a dominant chord. But so look, they all just have F sharp in them. There are no other sharps. You know, you've got A minor, D7, G major, right? And on, only the B's got that extra sharp there. Why should you know it in a bunch of keys? Because uh, a lot of singers like to sing this song. And I, I, I like to sing it in this key. The falling leaves drift by my window The autumn leaves of red and gold And since the song starts, like if it's in E minor, you know, it kind of feels like a minor key song, really. Um, it starts on the four chord, right? So you have to start right on the root with the melody, and then you go to the four chord, okay? So, you know, people show up with their song list, and it'll, it'll have the key that they do the song in, and at least 50% of the time, it'll, they'll have that four chord as being, you know, what key they do the song in. So they say, I do the song in A minor. The falling leaves, right? Because there's A minor, but really the song's in E minor. Okay? C minor. First chords F minor. The falling leaves, the falling leaves drift by my window. The autumn leaves of red and gold. That could be a good girl key, I think. Yeah. Because usually a guy key, you know, most of the time these songs are written in the guy key because you know, guys wrote them and, or most of the time, and, and, uh, and then when the girls sang them, they sang them in a soprano voice and uh, just sang them an octave higher back in the day. Nowadays, people like to put the song in their own comfortable range, so most of the time a, a guy sings it in whatever key and, and then the uh, girl sings it up a fifth or up a fourth. Now, an another thing about when you're like accompanying a vocalist or even accompanying yourself singing, which would be accompanying a vocalist, this is why it's important to know the melody, because you, do, you don't want to play your chord and sing the falling leaves and play that note, okay? It makes the, it makes the singer like strain to you know, get right in on the key so it doesn't, it doesn't sound off, and it, you know, you're doubling the, the vocal line, which occasionally works, but uh, generally what you want to do is you know, not, well not play the melody either, the falling leaves. So I'm singing that note. I'm singing that note, and my top note is there. See, so I'm not competing with the uh, with the vocal. Drift by my window, the autumn leaves of red and gold. You know, so I'm singing that. Well, it's down an octave. I miss your lips. The summer kisses, the sunburned hands. Now, like if you sang hands and played this, hands, you know, it, it can work if you're the singer and you're the one playing the chord because you expect, you know, you, you, you know you're going to hit that minor second there. Hands I used to hold. And if you listen to like uh, Jacob Collier or somebody, you know, you're, you're going to hear a lot of that kind of thing real close harmony like that. But if you're accompanying another singer, um, unless they're just really, really solid, you want to try to avoid playing like some tension on a chord that's real close to the melody and, and clashes with it. 
Okay, so that's why you need to know the melody, so you can avoid the melody as you play chords. I've covered Autumn Leaves in, uh, in other videos, that little part near the end where you have the uh, descending chords that are go, come a little faster. But I miss you most of all, my darling. See, right there I'm singing that note, but my chord was uh, a G on top, and then I went to that. That's still going to support it. All right? But I stayed out of that range. I didn't go, uh, My darling, when autumn leaves start to fall. Like I say, if you've got a singer holding that note out, they'll feel like you're supporting them better. You know, if you put down a third from the melody, down a little bit from the melody, you know, keeping with the third there. Instead of going like, you know, supporting the melody with that interval, put the put the G on top there. Yeah, it hel helps the vocalist sing in tune. All of me. Okay, uh, you know the common guy key is C, and the, and the common girl key is D flat. No, common girl key is up a fifth, G major. Or maybe F. All right. So let's do it. Let's see. What do you want? F or F or G? Let me see a show of hands. F, nobody. All right. G, nobody. I'll do it in F sharp then. Fuck you. I told you I am sloppy this morning. Yeah, like if you hit that flat five there, the singer would turn around and give you the dirtiest look you have ever seen in your life. So don't ever do that. Yeah, you might think a flat five chord would be cool there. And, you know, if you're taking a solo or something, that, that maybe you could get away with it. See? Where was it again? You could get away with it in a solo, but don't do it for the singer. All right. So, you know, it starts on the one chord, goes up to the three chord, which is a dominant. Do some open voicings here. Then the uh, six chord, another dominant. I think this one's a minor. Back to the, you know, the uh, three chord there. It's a dominant, so you can always put the little two in front of it. And, you know, the melody there is the fourth. So use some cool chord like that, you know, the minor major seventh. There's a nice 13 chord if you're playing the melody. standard voicings now. You know, I just played something in the key of G flat that it, 
it occurs to me that I don't think I ever play that exact change in, in like a key like F, you know, and it's a pretty simple change, you know, you're, you're going from a two and then you want to go to the five, but you're going to do that little, uh, what would you call that? Well, you, what it is, is it's preceding the five chord with another five chord, all right? It's actually the, the sub of G. Why not take all of me? Right, you're on G minor, then you change it to G dominant seventh. All of me. And then you do a tritone substitution. Why not take all of me? But I did this. And what did I do? I went, yeah, sharp nine chord, see? And that's the flat 13 up there, so it's a nice chord. And then I went to a just regular nine. Normally, I think I'd go like that, which is not very good. Maybe I wouldn't even do anything. I just you run into shit when you're playing in a different key. Okay, blue bossa. I've covered this in like 10 videos, 500 tutorial videos on YouTube for blue bossa. What am I going to show you that's different? Uh, I'm going to show you a little thing that I was practicing uh, two fives, uh, a minor two fives the other day. You know, I was using rootless voicings. Sorry. And then the two five. Okay, so there's the two five one in a minor key. And it's not exactly a rootless voicing, but it's what you call a hip voicing because it's hip sounding. If you looked at my previous videos, these are called box voicings. At least that's what I've called them and that's how I was taught. But they're, uh, sometimes they're called the A voicing and the B voicing because, you know, if you do take a two five one like this, all right, and there's your five chord. That's a G with a nine and a 13. And then you can invert that chord like this. So this is the a, a voicing and this is the B voicing. I call it box one and box two. But, um, you know, because that's not an A chord and that's not a B chord, so I don't want any confusion about it, all right? This voicing could be G, it could be D flat, altered, it could be D minor, six, nine, it could be B minor, seven, flat, five, it could be a few other chords too. Um, so, what I thought I'd do is explore two five ones in a minor key in all 12 keys and I realized that there are some keys that I really am just not very fluent in like in C minor I can just throw some shit down with no problem you know no problem I can just here's the exercise I came up with I got the two and then the five and then I play C minor and it can be you know you can use that box voicing there, see, for C minor. But I just use a C minor seventh, something like that, like this. And what I do is I'm going to move around with these box voicings. Now, if you're in a particular key, like C minor, and you want the two chord, you can just look up at the fifth and play the right box voicing there. Play the A voicing, with that as the top note, okay? Then you can go up a minor third to get to the uh, five chord. All right, I know it's a fourth there, but these chords are functioning different. That's a minor seven flat five. This is a uh, dominant chord. So it just works. You go up a minor third like that. All right, you can do the math on your own of, about this. All right. All right, and then C minor. And then, you know, I do like this. And then come back down this way, C minor. And then try that one again, because I don't do it very often. And then I'll do this one. Now, that's a little low for this particular one, but in some of the other keys it works better. And it's not bad. That's G. And then C, we're getting kind of low. We could maybe use a little fragment or, or just anything. You could use a fourth or, or whatever you like. You know. Whatever scale I'm using here, which is F minor melodic ascending, and here it's going to be uh, A flat minor melodic ascending, and then C whatever. Same here, you know, it's just different.
So it's easy to find the two chord here because you got the two right there on the bottom. But it's harder to find that two chord in this position. Because you, you know, you're used to thinking that as a B flat seventh or an E altered or something. And if you want to use it as a minor seven flat five chord, you know, whatever key you're in, C, think of the fifth, throw down that box a, box one A voice, and that's your that's your two chord. Alright? And then you can go up a minor third, or you can drop down like this and use the B voicing. See, this is a B voicing, that's a B voicing. That's our, our home key. B voicing, A voicing, and I thinned it out a little bit. All right, take it up to the next key, C sharp. All right, this would be good study. So we got C sharp. All right, think of the five. There, there's my two chords. See, I just thought of the fifth, you know. And you just get used to these A voicings, and they're pretty easy to find, because you've used them for other things. You've used it for F, you've used it for B, whatever. So, C. And then, of course, you got to know what scale to put with it. But, you know, it doesn't matter. If you were using it as an F chord, or as a B chord, or as a, uh, a what, F sharp minor, or here we're using it as E flat, minor 7 flat 5 it doesn't matter the same scale goes with every single one you use that voicing use the same scale so it is yeah, F, F sharp minor melodic ascending see that works with B it works with F and it works with E flat and then I can go up a minor 3rd I don't know my I'm just I've you know played enough jazz that you know, whenever I hit this chord, my right hand just knows which scale to play. You know, it's it's not like I have to think about it. That's, I have to, to explain it to you, I have to think about it. But for me to play it, I don't think about it. Except in some of these fucked up keys, you know, like this key, I have to think about it. All right, so. So I'm on the five there. I think maybe the hardest one is going from there and coming down, you know, you come down like this. Because you got to switch from that voice into that voice, and I'm just not quite used to doing that. And then the one I'm really not used to do is. But that's a real cool sounding one, and you know, uh, uh, it's it's just been a, uh, a a black hole in my in my learning over the years not to have worked on that one. Two, five, one. And I'm aware of it, you know. All right, so then now we get to D. Now look, I, I don't have to think about this. Uh, e flat, and there's my two chord, and there's my two chord. See, I, I, this little exercise I did yesterday has really helped out because I couldn't find that chord very quickly. You know, I had to think too much about it. Now I got a little trick. E flat. There's, there's the fifth of E flat, and that's my two chord. And then I can come down here. All right, so here we go. go through all 12 keys, do I? Okay, uh, let's see, Satin Doll. All right, this, uh, this is a song that's, you know, it's a good song. I, I think it was just one of those ones that got played too much. You know, it was so popular that uh, now, you know, jazz players kind of tend to look down their nose at it. But, you know, Oscar Peterson played it, and a real, another real good version is uh, McCoy Tyner. It's one of his early albums. He plays Satin Doll. And you can just hear little, little traces of what's to come with McCoy. You know, you can hear him use some of those cool uh, fourth voicings a little bit. But mostly he plays it pretty straight. And, you know, you've got to know the intro right here. And, you know, the guy key is C major. <laughs> Cigarette holder, 
which wakes me. See, I played the melody there. I shouldn't have done that. Cigarette holder, which wigs me over my shoulder. She digs me out, catting my satin doll. Baby, should we go out skipping? Careful, amigo, I'm flipping. Speak Latin, my satin doll. She's nobody's fool, but she's playing it cool as can be. I'll give it a whirl, but I ain't for no girls chasing me. Telephone numbers that you know I'm doing my rumbas with Thuno and that and my satin doll. One thing to study is, you know, when it goes, okay, I talked about this once when I was talking about dominant motion, the, f the four ways to get to C. Of course, Jacob Collier's got like 30 ways to get to C, but I got four ways. One way is two, five, one. The other way is two, flat, two, one. And then you can do okay, A flat minor. And this uh, uses that last way. This song. So A flat minor. Okay, and you can use this in a lot of tunes uh, instead of like a typical 2 5 1. And, you know, it, it does take the song out there a little ways. Uh, but it's a, it's a cool thing. And, of course, it's built into this song. So it's a good place to practice it and do it in a bunch of different keys, of course. But, you know, as you're, as you're practicing the improv. <laughs> So just A flat minor, and then maybe diminished scale or a Lydian dominant a D, or you could just think G alternate, or a D flat Lydian dominant. Same damn thing. All right. So in the next installment, we're gonna have "Fly Me to Your Room." So frickin' what? because I copied it off the little preview. Sorry, Amy. I sent you money, though. Uh, oh, Straight No Chaser. Yeah, I don't know that one. I mean, I kind of do. Summertime. And Olio. I don't know Olio. I, came, I, I couldn't even tell you how it goes. I think it's rhythm changes or something. All right, so we'll, we'll have lots to say about those five. I have to do some practicing first. I'll be back.